In November of 1919, Ponzi, small in stature but big in dreams, determined that postal reply coupons could be his mother load. Ponzi saw an opportunity with postal reply coupons that, properly exploited, could result in great wealth. Ponzi realized that if you went to a European post office with American dollars and bought postal reply coupons and then brought them to this country and cashed them in, you got U.S. postage many times more valuable than the U.S. money you spent for them. It was a legitimate opportunity of what we might call arbitrage. And this was the premise. Ponzi believed that for every dollar of postal reply coupons purchased, he could earn five dollars when he redeemed them for stamps. With a 400% profit from these initial purchases, Ponzi would buy additional coupons and redeem them for even more money. It seemed to be a proposition that couldn't lose. The ebullient Ponzi chatted up his convoluted idea to friends and associates in restaurants and clubs throughout Boston. He had this gift of gab, and he just had this overwhelming personality and the smile, smile at all times. No matter how bad things got, he had to smile. He seemed to glitter, he seemed to sparkle. He had, a, he had an immense air of supreme confidence about himself. He really thought he was very special, and it, it just shows. Ponzi offered anyone a cut of the action if they invested money with him. He promised investors a 50% return on their money in 45 days, or he would double their money in just three months. In November of 1919, Charles Ponzi opened the Securities Exchange Company, or SEC, in a cramped and dingy office in downtown Boston. A few risk takers took a gamble on Ponzi's deal. True to his word, Ponzi paid them their principal and interest as promised. I convince you somehow to give me $100 telling you that in a short period of time I'll give you back 200 and when the time comes I do give you 200 you're going to do two things first of all you're going to tell everybody you know about it and secondly you're going to give me back the $200 that's exactly what his investors did although word of this amazing offer spread quickly Ponzi engaged sales agents including his uncle who also invested and paid them a 10% commission for every investor dollar they brought to the SEC. Ponzi himself would deal with the complexities of buying and selling postal reply coupons. All his investors had to do was hand over their money, and in exchange they would receive a note promising them a return of principal plus interest in 45 or 90 days. Ponzi couldn't print them quickly enough. By February of 1920, Ponzi's SEC had received $5,000. Ponzi happily accepted money from all comers, including $800 from his wife, Rose. By March, more than 100 people had invested almost $30,000. But Ponzi owed these investors more than $45,000 in principal and interest. Fortunately for Ponzi, when the notes came due, most depositors kept their money invested to accrue even more interest. The smooth and self-assured Ponzi had a ready answer for every doubt or question. The effervescent Italian was able to convince even the most skeptical investors with his snappy patter. Ponzi had not studied finance, but Ponzi had a bent for mathematics, and he had supreme confidence that if you throw enough numbers at people, their eyes will glaze over and they will think you know what you're talking about. As torrents of money flowed daily into the coffers of the Security Exchange Company, Ponzi adjusted to his stunning success. He uh, greatly expanded his office. He hired people to uh, stand behind his telecages and take in the money. He hired managers. The money began flowing in at such a massive rate that he also hired Boston policemen to stand outside his business for $100. And every few minutes, 
one of the policemen would carry a satchel full of cash to the bank. Ponzi's young company had taken in three million dollars by July, but owed investors four and a half million. Charles Ponzi was succeeding beyond even his own wild dreams. But he stood at the top of a very dangerous pyramid. Every dollar made him richer and put him deeper into debt. And always he had this confidence that if he got enough money in the bank, he could buy the best lawyers, he could buy the best judges, and maybe he could use that money to invest in a real business that would get him out of the hole that the point of the pyramid was digging deeper and deeper every day. And people withdrew their money from banks to put everything with Ponzi. With income from his venture growing exponentially, Ponzi invested in the good life for himself. He bought a huge house outside of Boston, and he put in, at that time, we're talking 1920, he put in central heat and air conditioning, a heated swimming pool, that was unheard of. He spent $500,000 alone on the furnishings for the home, which is a lot of money nowadays, but back then that was a tremendous amount of money. Ponzi brought his mother, Imelda, over from Italy via first-class ocean liner, donated $100,000 to a local orphanage, and hired publicity agent William McMasters to help with the onslaught of notoriety. The crowds outside Ponzi's School Street office caused curious officials to check things out. So three police officers came to Ponzi to find out whether he was legitimate or not. And after talking to him for a few minutes, two of the policemen decided to invest with Ponzi. And then it was estimated at the end that about a quarter of Boston's policemen were investing with Ponzi. Six months earlier, the diminutive Italian had been flat broke. Now, Charles Ponzi was basking in his newfound celebrity, swarmed by mobs of cheering fans wherever he went. In the Italian neighborhoods of Boston, he was a god. Ponzi was the image to them of, of everything they dreamed of. He had achieved this immense success. Not only that, they were all profiting immensely. Their money was being doubled. Somebody asked a member of the crowd about who was a very important person in America, and they answered Charles Ponzi. And he was there, and he said, well, what about Columbus? And they said, well, Columbus discovered America, but you're the man who invented money. And that was the way they felt about him. He was idolized. The first chink in Ponzi's financial armor arose when J.R. Daniels, the furniture dealer who had helped start Ponzi's business, came back into the picture. In the early summer of 1920, Daniels decided to sue Ponzi for one and a half million dollars because Daniels saw all of this money going into the Securities Exchange Company. He thought he was a partner. Ponzi owed him money, so he decided to sue. And this was part of the beginning of Ponzi's downfall when Daniels' suit brought attention to the fact that Ponzi was in this small office on rented furniture. How come he says he has all of these millions of dollars floating around? Although Daniel's claim was more sour grapes than a legitimate beef, an article about the suit published in the Boston Post brought a swift reaction. There was a run on Ponzi's securities exchange company as some investors clamored for their money. One way Ponzi stopped the runs was by simply giving the money back. He could say, I can give away $200,000 a day, and it doesn't hurt me. And this then would stop the run as people would say, look, he's giving the money back, and more people would line up to try to invest. Both the commissioner of banks and the attorney general of Massachusetts had heard about Ponzi's company and sent some men to investigate. But on July 24, 1920, a surprisingly positive Boston Post article profiled Ponzi and his money-making machine. As a result, hundreds of people jammed the offices of Ponzi's SEC to invest. Prior to the article's publication, the millions of dollars that flowed into Ponzi's waiting hands had derived solely from word of mouth. 
he was averaging in a very short space of time about $250,000 a day. And that is a lot of money when you put it in the context of the 1920s. Back then, a millionaire was somebody who was very, very rare. And so somebody who was receiving in $250,000 a day, that was a lot of money to be dealing with. The same day the Post article hit the stands, Ponzi met with government officials at the Massachusetts State House. After determining that his books were too convoluted to sort out, Ponzi offered them a plan. Well, Ponzi really had no books. But he said, I will volunteer to stop taking in money while you're doing the audit. I will continue to pay out money because I am so rich I can afford to do this. But I won't take anything more if you think there's the slightest suspicious thing going on here. And they said, well, okay, that, that sounds all right to us. So they did not close him down immediately. In the meantime, Ponzi had been developing a new scheme that might free him from his looming predicament. He would convince his bankers to provide $10 million to purchase a fleet of merchant ships that were being sold by the U.S. government. Ponzi's plan was to transfer all of his company's assets and liabilities to the proposed steamship company, allowing his investors to trade in their investments for stock in the new company. Ponzi's plan failed to impress the bankers, and the scheme never materialized. By July 26th, the Boston Post had dug deeper into the dapper Italian's fuzzy financials and ran the first in a series of negative articles about Charles Ponzi and his SEC. They contacted Clarence Barron. He was the Wall Street publisher that put, put out Barron's paper. And Barron wrote a, an article in which he said, if Ponzi can make 300% profit for his investors, why is he putting his money in banks that are only paying 2 or 3%? Why isn't he investing in his own company? The resulting panic caused a frantic run on Ponzi's security exchange company. When hundreds of people lined up to get their precious money back, a near riot ensued and a few women fainted. Nearly two million dollars were withdrawn from Ponzi's School Street office in less than three days. But the always positive Ponzi paid everyone back with a smile on his face. And Ponzi went out to this, this huge crowd of people, serving them coffee and donuts while they waited in line. He said, I can afford to do this. You have nothing to worry about. Some people turned away and said, all right, we'll leave our money in there. And this was going on while the auditors went on, you know, when we're, we're doing their work. In response to the rising chorus of newspaper allegations, Ponzi was quoted as saying, I have just used this postal coupon idea as a blind. I didn't want the Wall Street boys to get even a hint of what my scheme is. As long as my depositors get their investments with profit, I don't have to account to anybody. Though Charles Ponzi maintained his exuberant demeanor, the noose seemed to be tightening. On August 10th, 1920, U.S. federal agents converged on Ponzi's Securities Exchange Company and impounded everything in the offices. Ever the optimist, Ponzi kept his appointment to speak at the local Kiwanis Club that day. The theme of his talk was finance. On August 12, 1920, Ponzi met again with the officials who were investigating him. The authorities were there, his books were being examined, and Ponzi, graceful to the end, finally said to them, are you telling me, gentlemen, that I'm insolvent? And they replied, yes. And he said, in that case, I am your prisoner. And the business was over. The federal government indicted Charles Ponzi on 86 counts of fraud. It was interesting, when they went into the office to arrest him, the mob there virtually attacked the arresting agents. They were very upset. This was their hero. This man was inventing money for them. 
they all had visions of America providing them with their dream, which was to become wealthy. As it turned out, Ponzi never purchased any postal reply coupons. But nearly 17,000 investors had plunged more than $10 million into Ponzi's coffers within an eight-month period. At that time, he owed $15 million, but that was in 1920 terms. $10 million in 1920 might be worth a quarter of a billion today. I mean, $250 million. There were heartrending accounts of investors who stood to lose everything. Charles Ponzi went to trial in the fall of 1920. On November 1st, he pled guilty to a federal charge of using the mails to defraud and was sentenced to five years in prison. Ponzi's wife, Rose, fainted when the judgment was announced. Ponzi was sent to Plymouth Jail, where he sent letters to many of his investors, writing that he hoped the recent miscarriage of your investments would not mar the spirit of the Christmas season. Many investors wrote back to the man who had so happily taken their money. Some of it were absolutely scathing. You've stolen everything I had, calling probably every name in the book. Some were very consoling and sympathetic with him and admiring even, saying what a great man he was. And he even received money. <laughs> People would send money so that he could invest it when he got out. There were still believers out there. In 1931, a bankruptcy court determined that the insolvent Ponzi still owed his remaining investors more than $2 million. Many depositors received just pennies for every dollar they had so trustingly invested. Some wishful thinkers, believing that Ponzi would one day make them whole, held on to their SEC notes and received nothing. <laughs>